Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 48, I chat with Ty Roberts about Grace Note's impact on digital media. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, episode 48, recorded December 27th, 2010, by the grace of Grace Note. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off the lifetime of your new account, go to Squarespace.com and use the offer code HTG. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here with UltimateAVMag.com and HomeTheaterMag.com. On this, the last show of 2010, my guest geek of the week is Ty Roberts, CTO of Gracenote, a developer of music and video technology and databases, uh, which we will find out what exactly that means. Hey, Ty, welcome to the show. Hey, Scott. I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here. It's quite an honor to be on your last show of the year. Thank you. It's an honor to have you with us, and uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, on this week before Christmas, uh, between Christmas and New Year's, uh, when I'm sure you must have plenty of other family obligations and things to do. Well, with your fancy technology, I'm able to broadcast this straight from my home, so that's not so bad. <laughs> Ain't Skype grand. It wasn't last week, I hear. I, I, I heard that uh, it had a problem, not during my podcast, but uh, Leo apparently had some problems. Yesterday as well. Oh, really? <laughs> Yes. Well, <clears throat> well, how good, how good that then that we're we're working here. Um, I want to say before we start that uh, those who are logged into the live video stream at live.twit.tv or logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions for Ty, and I'll pass on as many as I can. So I wanted to start Ty by asking, what the heck is Grace Note? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, first of all, a grace note is a uh, an embellishment, kind of a lead-in note. So if you're a musician, it's it's kind of like the note to get everyone kind of going or in the right key, and then you go mm -hmm. into the song. And so it's an embellishment to the song. It's not the song itself, and that's really mm -hmm. what grace does. Um, we as a company provide information about music and movies and TV programs. We don't make the TV programs. We don't distribute the TV programs. But we give you all the information you need to actually figure out what you might want to listen to or might want to watch. And uh, uh, I started the company in 1998, and uh, it's grown to about 300 people now. Mm. Now, am I, am I not mistaken that it was uh, originally CDDB? Yes, it was CDDB, but then we started doing DVDs, and it was going to be like CDD, DVD, B. It just ran out of <laughs> something better. Right, so Alphabet Soup wasn't really going to work. No, it really wasn't working at all. And in fact, what's funny is is that um, uh, a lot of people do know the CDDB name because it actually was flashed on the screen of applications that use it. So iTunes and other applications, when you put a CD in, it says accessing CDDB. Well, now it says accessing Grace Note, but it would say that. So I used to have jackets and T-shirts that have our company logo on it, and I'd be in the airport like in Tokyo, and people would come, I know that company, I know I know what you do. So actually the name got out there quite a, quite a bit as CDDB, and then we, when we got into video and other things, we broadened the name and kind of renamed the company Gracenet. Mm -hmm. That's actually pretty cool that uh, that it is sort of a preparation for the music, uh, yes. in a sense. Um, That's right. Because what <clears throat> what I think uh, you're doing is providing what is often called metadata. That's correct. Things yeah, like cover art and and uh, artist information, lyrics, maybe. Yes, basically, uh, you know, the music is just the sound of the music. But what you use to pick what you're going to listen to is really the information about the music, where it was recorded, uh, who it was the, uh, you know, the artist, where did they live, what did they do. These kind of things all come from our database for music. And in movies, it's very similar. What genre is the movie in? You know, who's the director of the movie? Who stars in it? Um, a lot of people really find out what they want to watch or listen to just by the people that are involved because uh, they may not actually know the piece of music they're going to pick. Now, this is actually a very important part of what you do, is it not, that um, w there's so much music out there and video um, that it's hard to find things you might be interested in, especially new things you don't know about. 
And, well, and am I correct that Grace Note is is one of the fundamental uh, goals of Grace Note is to help you find stuff you might be interested in. That, that's correct. Basically, the first thing that anyone would want to do is just have some information on all the music. It would be very strange to walk into if this was, you know, it's digital, so you can't really see it. But if it was a record store, you'd be walking into if every CD was blank that was in there and there were <laughs> a, a million of them. That would like not be very good. You could just start playing them one after another, but it might not be very satisfactory after about four or five weeks of doing that. So instead what we do is we label them all first, just get all the right basic information on there and at least know where the music's from and at least know who the artists are and make sure all that stuff's correct. And then we try to then go beyond that to actually look at the music from a, I'll call it an editorial perspective as well as kind of a, a logarithmic perspective where we analyze the sound of the music to power uh, uh, recommendation services. So. Our data that can, talks about what's really in the music and what makes up the musical work uh, is really, for example, what's behind uh, Genius, which Apple produces. It's basically, we give them very detailed information on the songs. They have their own algorithm for how it exactly picks which one, but uh, it's all of our very uh, useful information, which makes it go. Uh, I'm going to ask you about uh, iTunes Genius in a minute, but first, I want to ask you, where do you, where do you, where does Grace Note get the data uh, about all this metadata information? Well, we had to hire all those guys that used to work in the record stores. <laughs> the video stores. Um, you know, the ones that used to say Picks by Susie, that kind of stuff. We we seek these people out globally, and we have a huge editorial team. We have people, yes, we have people in California, but we have people in Korea, Japan, Europe, China, uh, all the major markets where we have local people basically putting in information. And then even beyond that, that wasn't even enough. We couldn't even hire enough people really to do everything we needed to do, so we actually... Uh, work with a large fleet of I'll call it independent people that basically do this because they're fans or experts in a particular genre of music or a particular type of movie, and uh, we give them tools and they can basically work with our database and and help bring this information into the system. And uh, it takes expert knowledge, and uh, it's really good that we're getting it because in fact a lot of this knowledge is somewhat fleeting. The people who know a lot about this may not be with us forever, and so it's great to get it into the computer where we can have it forever to to use to teach new people about new types of music and have people have a broad experience rather than just a narrow experience that's focused around what's just the most popular thing out in the world today. Mm -hmm. Isn't there some of this metadata encoded in CDs and DVDs and Blu-rays and so on that you can just pull off of them when somebody uh, plays? Very little. <laughs> very little, really. Well, interestingly enough, I think Blu-ray has a little more, but, but uh, CDs were never designed to have... They, were, they had ability to put text inside the tracks so that on CD players that were advanced, they could put the name of the song on the display. And some people may have a car that the song names show up from the CD. But it turns out it's inside the track. So to get to it, you have to actually play the track, which doesn't help you when you're trying to select what track to play. It's kind of mm. backwards. So they never really thought about it. They, when CDs were created, there was no real concept that they would really uh, go into computers and that people would digitize them and then put them in. I mean, none of that stuff existed. You know, we're talking, you know, the 80s. And so the reality is, is that uh, uh, CDs didn't have anything. So the names of the songs and all the information comes from us. Um, and we just use kind of the, uh, a trick, which is the lengths of the track, uh, of the tracks that are on the CD, kind of the, how long the song is to create kind of a phone number. So if the first song's like a minute and 43 seconds, the second one's two minutes and 50, we just stack those numbers up in sequence, and that becomes kind of the unique, uh, I'll call it fingerprint for the CD. And uh, we looked it up in our database and tell you what it is. And it's, uh, it's rare that you can, if you can imagine having two CDs with 10 tracks on it, where they would have you know, 10 songs of exactly the same length and the same sequence down to a 75th of a second. So it's actually a pretty <laughs> unique. Yeah, that would be huh, very so weird. So that does make a fingerprint. That's interesting. It does I actually. Never... We have a few collisions in the database. It does not, this never happens, but it's very, very rare. Wow. I'm actually amazed that it, that it sometimes happens, that it's not unique, completely unique. Well, it turns out also there are many variants of a CD because they, you know, they repress them and they remaster them and the record companies uh, changed hands, you know, who owned the CDs. And so, you know, the same David Bowie CD came out from RCA. It also came out from Virgin. He was on there for a while. And then on Ryko Disc, he was on there for a while. So there are, uh. they typically in those re-releases, they, as audio technology improved, they kept enhancing the sound. You know, they kind of go back to studio and remaster it. And that's why CDs today really, you know, uh, sound really, really good because they, they know what they're doing. But some of the ones that were originally put out at the very beginning of the, the dawn of the CD area really, frankly, don't sound that good because the technology for making them wasn't that good. Mm -hmm. We already have a question in the chat room. 
Uh, <clears throat> F Loop is uh, asking, does Grace Note run up against any copyright issues, and if so, how do you manage them? Well, two two things there. We have we have data that is copyrighted. That's data that we actually partner with the record companies to have. So the album cover artwork is something that's copyrightable, and um, we do a licensing deal with the record companies, and we actually help uh, organize the cover art and put it into the system and get high resolution copies and. Uh, it's a partnership we have with the recording business to do that. But the information about the titles and who the artist is and everything but the lyrics, really, is I'll call factual information. It's just like if you were to have a, you know, there's, you know, a Roger Ebert's book on movies. Well, reality is his prose about the movie that's in there, that's copyrightable. But the basic facts of what year it was recorded in are these things are just facts. And so our mm -hmm. database is of, I'll call it factual information, which is public domain, and then uh, copyrighted information, which either we created, because if we made the descriptions of it, or that we licensed from somebody else or, or created. So when we deliver to the end customer, be it Apple or somebody else, all of that stuff is packaged together and licensed appropriately. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> have you ever had anybody um, uh, refuse you permission to, say, uh, uh, package the lyrics? Uh, lyrics is definitely a challenge, but not so much uh, uh, people... I don't think there's really been ever anybody asked to like have be like removed from the database. We've had some some people wanting to make their entries better, or put more information in, or correct some stuff, but uh, no one's really had a problem with the, the database in that regard. The, mm -hmm. the the information about the lyrics is, is tricky because uh, lyrics are actually owned uh, by music publishers, and the music publishing situation is pretty complicated. Um, if you look on any CD label, you'll see you know. Poly Pachyderm songs, you know, you know, Purple Publishing Corp, you know, there'll be all these kind of crazy names on there. And, and the reason is, is that each song has a different kind of ownership structure. Sometimes, like, it's the artist in combination with the writer. Sometimes there's multiple writers. If it's a hip-hop record, there'd be two or three guys coming to the studio that do some mixes on, on the recording. They're on there. So to get lyrics online really requires a little bit more uh, complicated rights issue, which is we have to track those people down. So actually, mm -hmm. we have a lyric product just for the United States right now. We don't actually have a, we don't really have a lyric, we don't really provide the ability to see the lyrics outside the United States. We allow you to search for songs by lyrics anywhere in the world, but we don't let you see the lyrics except in the United States. So hmm. definitely hmm. wish that situation was simpler. Everybody would like to see the lyrics. It's the number one requested thing on the planet. So it's always the top search term in Google. And, you know, it'd be a, right now the problem is, is that there's a limited ability to put these things together. We're doing as much as anyone. We're basically... I think have the largest uh, legal licensed uh, lyrics database, but I still don't have the world of lyrics. Wish I wish I did. <laughs> Here's a great question that that uh, I wish I'd thought of, which is how do you make money providing a database of this metadata? We d don't charge the end consumers. We charge the creator of the software product. So, for example, Apple pays us to put the data into their system, mm -hmm. but sort of you know consumer electronics company Sony pays us to put it inside their devices, inside their TVs. Um, so basically, it's licensed on a kind of a, uh, a per usage uh, basis, and uh, uh, it's you know it's it's a, a pretty good business once you get hundreds of millions of people using it like we have. Yeah, indeed. Now, before you were at uh, uh, Grace Note, uh, you were at a company called Ion, which then got uh, acquired by Grace Note. Have I got that right? Yeah. You, yes. Exactly. I was. Uh, uh, basically, before the internet, if you can imagine such a such a time period. I can't, um, but okay. <laughs> uh, which is all over like 1996 or 1998. Um, yeah. Uh, there was this thing called CD-ROM. Essentially, the idea was you, you put graphics and multimedia information on the actual disc, and then when you put it inside of a computer, it would pop up and, and play. And so uh, uh, at that time, I had come out of kind of a video game background, and I basically was doing... Uh, uh, video game programming, and as well, I was writing software for professional musicians. And so um, it turned out one of the professional musicians that used my my music software uh, was a guy named Todd Rundgren. And Todd Rundgren's a, uh, an artist. He had a lot of ideas for multimedia. And I started to kind of work with him to create what I call a multimedia record album. Essentially, if you can imagine, like, there would actually be graphics for every song, and there would be interactive experiences in there. And so that idea kind of caught on for a period from about 96, well, 93 to about 97. And I worked on these. Ion basically published and created interactive record albums for David Bowie, uh, Todd Rundgren, a band called Primus, see Soundgarden, Ollie Fakatur, uh, I don't know, quite a few titles. And uh, 
it was a great experience for me because I got to go into the studio with musicians and you know, I got to be in the studio with Brian Eno and David Bowie and I got to think about what computer graphics should go with their new album and uh, how, how it should be interactive. And really, um, uh, it was a great opportunity at that time for the record album to evolve into something that was much more like what the film industry has. They have a DVD and has many music graphics. But unfortunately, just as this was getting going, <laughs> the internet <laughs> came along and obliterated CD-ROM. And the only problem with the internet was it was very slow, and the only thing you could really do on the internet was text and a little bit, of maybe a little picture. And so, uh, so I went off and did the CD database, which essentially is a text database starting out. Now we have graphics and things, but in the day it was text. And unfortunately, the record industry didn't really come up with a multimedia graphical album. And that's kind of an unfortunate fact. The record album could, could stand for some embellishment and some better interactivity something mixing the web with what's going on. So I still mm -hmm. believe in that, and I'm still hoping to get back to that kind of a project someday soon. Now, just out of my own personal curiosity, it doesn't really have anything to do with home theater, but seeing as how I'm a musician, I'm curious, what kind of software were you, were you writing for professional musicians? I worked on two products. I worked on a product called Studio Session and a product called Jam Session. And these were, uh, trans well, Studio Session was a transcription product that essentially allowed people to type uh, play music in on a MIDI keyboard, and then it would actually draw the notes onto a Macintosh, and all this stuff was for, like, the Mac, the 512K Mac. and the, uh, <laughs> My first Mac was a 512K. Oh, so basically, I made this this, uh, this, this this software product with a couple other guys, and uh, the, the product was actually fairly broadly used by musicians. And uh, uh, so that actually... They, you know, of course, musicians want, you know, want a feature. You know, Todd Rundgren needs a feature. He just calls you up and says, "Hey, can you put this in?" So uh, that and when Todd Rundgren calls you and asks you, you, you probably do it, huh? Yeah, exactly. So we basically, we basically started getting to work directly with with uh, him and some other artists. And right around that time, computer graphics were happening, and all the power of the personal computer was really getting put into the hands of the of individuals. So mm -hmm. you know, I could write code and I could think of these ideas and. Uh, uh, it was reasonably personable, and uh, I could I could listen to what Todd wanted to do, and so I started to work on you know a concept for him. And uh, actually, uh, there were several other people at the t same time wanting to have that kind of MIDI authoring capability. Now this, of course, is you know there's Digital Design as a company that makes all these software packages, and pretty much a very similar bent to what uh, what I was doing in in, in, in my day. Mm -hmm. And now Grace Note has acquired Ion. What? parts of the ION technology are you using now? Well, that's kind of interesting. So at the very end of the, of the I'll call it multimedia record album era, we, we had this epiphany, which was, because the internet was there. So we kind of realized is, why do I want to go through all this trouble to try to like get all the graphics and all of the multimedia stuff together for the album and then burn it onto the CD? That's like a really big problem. And the other problem is you have to do it before the CD comes out. So you can't like do it after you know it's going to be a hit CD. <laughs> so you're gonna miss <laughs> then the album stiffs and then you're like oh that was a lot of work so we realized why not put all the graphics and all the multimedia onto the internet onto a web page and then why not have something that when you put the cd into a computer could look up the cd in a database and just say where it lived on the internet like what's the url for the cd and then we'll show you the graphics that went with the cd you had and that is the cornerstone of uh, some patents that i got and so those patents are what came into uh, Grace Note, and the idea is really around basically music having a home, what's called on the internet, and what one would do with it once. What, what, would, what one would do with people if you could bring them to the home for the music that they had. And so that really was the genesis for a lot of the ideas in the company. And and uh, uh, so really, that's that's all it's really lived on. Unfortunately, I, I wish more of the multimedia album stuff had lived on, but it's still still to come. I think in the future. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's, it's actually the thing I'm most excited about, um, you know, what we're doing at, coming up at the CES show in Las Vegas. We're going to start showing you some stuff, which really has to do with, you know, people have these very, very large TVs now. And uh, when you play a song on, a, on your, you know, iTunes on your TV, what do you get? Well, you get, like, the album cover going like this, you know, like that first, like that. Except that we don't have the back. We only have the front of the album cover. So it kind of goes like this. And it kind of goes like this again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to get. I'm going to come back to CES in a minute. I, I want to. I want to uh, definitely want to talk about uh, what you're going to be showing there because that's coming up next week. Is it already? Good God! <laughs> um, but before I do, I want to. I want to still uh, touch a, on a couple other points. One is 
Um, okay, so Grace Note acquired Ion and used some of that technology. And then Grace Note, as I understand it, was acquired by Sony. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, so now yeah. you're an arm of Sony. Yes, I am actually a gainful, a gainfully employed Sony, Sony employee. Uh, so yes, what has actually happened is, is that uh, we built the company for about 10 years and we found ourselves in 2007 looking at what we needed to do with the company. And for a company to grow and expand, it needs, you know, it needs capital, like 300 people. You know, there's other businesses that we wanted to get in and we had all kinds of ideas. And so we thought, okay, we're going to try to go public. And uh, uh, sometime in the kind of beginning of 2008, as we're getting ready to go public, we're kind of on the path to do that. Uh, the people at Sony started, to, you know, expressing some interest, saying, "You know what? We really want to expand network services at Sony. You guys have all this expertise. We also uh, would leave you independent. You guys can continue to work with all your other customers. We just want you to help us a lot, and we think if we were part of our company, you could do more, help us more than as an external company." And so. Uh, we thought that was a pretty interesting offer. Um, and then as 2008 kind of rolled along, it began to look a little cloudy out there for the IPO market. It wasn't yet, you know, uh, economic meltdown. But things were getting a little rocky. Some people yeah. don't realize that because people, the election was coming and things were happening. So we actually thought maybe we should really take this seriously. And, and then uh, as we got deeper into knowing the people inside Sony, well, they had been a very good customer for ours for a long time. And... Uh, um, uh, the principal person uh, that was responsible for us for coming into Sony, uh, a guy named Tim Schaff, he was the guy I worked with at, at, at Apple on QuickTime. And so uh, I knew the people there, and they were nice, and uh, it seemed like they could accomplish the goals we wanted. And we've been part of the company now since uh, summer of 2008, and it's been great. The reality is they've left us independent. We've got the resources of their company. I've got an amazing playground of uh, new things that I can go – bring my mind to. And mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I'm pretty happy. I think everybody in the company is pretty happy. We all got PlayStations. That was pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I find it uh, fascinating and amazing, actually, that Sony would let you continue to work with who are essentially their competitors, like LG and Denon. Um, it's got it's gotten the, the consumer electronics world is no longer as black and white as it was, and so I mean, let's just to give you some examples. So first of all, Sony has a massive business making like iPod accessories for Apple, like speakers. And honestly, I don't know how big it is, but it's 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 big, probably bigger than mm -hmm. Grace now. Uh, and the reality is, uh, network services now. So if you look on the PlayStation, Sony has its own network service, but it also has Voodoo, which is like Walmart's service. And you know, if you look in the audio services, there's all kinds of it's, it's everybody has got everybody on everything. And, uh, <laughs> and the, the reality of that is, is that it's, uh, uh, that's actually the world we're in. It's much like the internet, you know, it's like, uh, you know, basically if you look at Facebook, Facebook got Facebook connect everywhere, you know, on every website that there is, some of which compete with Facebook, some of which don't. But the reality is I think you just have to go where consumers want you to go. And Sony really needed us to actually be a bridge to the little bit of that. So an example of that is, it's been an example of that is in the automotive industry right now. Um, there is a Ford car, and the Ford car contains Sony audio equipment as a stereo system and Grace Note metadata technology. And so uh, uh, there's uh, already been some fruitful partnerships, which are probably would have never necessarily occurred to them uh, without our help. We've basically been, you know, helping take them some new places, and they've taken us some new places as well. Hmm. It's great. It's actually great. I'm I'm very encouraged to see this sort of uh, synergistic approach and collaborative approach. Yes. And, uh, you know, which is, <clears throat> I think, fairly new in the business world and perhaps inculcated by uh, the presence of the Internet and, and so on. It kind of reminds me of, uh, of MIDI. Uh, you remember when MIDI started, uh, it, all these competitors got together and said, we need something that will allow our products to talk to each other. And so they co collaborated, cooperated on developing this music language called MIDI, uh, which still survives today, t some, what, 20, 25, 30 years later? Right, right. I think, I think really it has to do with just the reality. And home theater is the same way. So I think the idea of homogenous product, like I have, you know, in my house here, yes, of course I have Sony equipment in my house. And, but the reality is I also have other people's equipment in my house, and I love it really to actually all interoperate well together. Mm -hmm. And that's... So that's really where the industry is going. Like, you know, standards like DLNA allowed to allow these things to happen. It's 
it's impossible to think that one company is going to provide every single piece of gear that you need and every, and every service. I hope it doesn't ever turn out to be that. It's much better if you have all these ideas coming from all the different people and people are allowed to shine at what they're good at. And, uh, 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 you know, I see actually today so much more competition and innovation in the marketplace than there's been in a long time. I mean, it's, it's amazing, I mean, you know. Yeah. Facebook, Twitter, you know, everybody's got something cool coming out all the time. And, and so really um, your ability to partner with people and work with a vast array of people is probably the number one skill for businesses of the, of the future. Um, the uh, monodimensional, uh, it's my way or the highway, uh, probably is going to be a challenge way, unless you really can create every single new technology yourself and be ahead of everyone. I, I just don't know how you can do that. It's a new business paradigm because uh, it seems to me that in the old days, a company like Sony would in fact want to be the provider of everything. That's right. I think that they, I think that they, would like to provide you as much stuff as possible. <laughs> <But they're, laughs> is they realize that they really just need everything to work. Like the most important thing is when the people turn on the Sony thing, whatever that is, that it works and it works well with the other stuff that they've got. Um, that's really important. And consumers have so many choices now of all the things that you can get. Um, really, it, it, uh, uh, ease of use and functionality and high quality. So Sony's doing pretty pretty good at I think restructuring the company around these new ideas and. I think you'll see a lot more exciting uh, 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 things coming from in the future, which will which will demonstrate this you know kind of new Sony approach. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a few new products that uh, I wanted to make sure we touched upon. Uh, somebody in the chat room already has said that they're uh, shopping for the new LG. What is it? BD five ninety Blu-ray yeah. player with what's called Music ID, and this also is found in some Sony TVs. Tell us about that. Yeah, so what this technology is essentially is uh, uh, we've basically put software inside of these. These are connected devices. So you take this BD player and you plug it into the Internet or it connects wirelessly to, like, to the Internet or the TV. And what happens is you play some kind of content that has audio in it. It could be a movie. It could be a music video. It could be you're watching a YouTube video. It could be anything. And you push a button on the remote control. It samples about six seconds of the audio from the actual sound channel fingerprints it, in other words, it converts it to some numbers, and then sends that to our database. And then we look it up in our database, and we come back and say, oh, well, that's, uh, you know, this song by Miley Cyrus, or whatever it is, and the person can then find out information about it, and then typically uh, they can go off and purchase it, or they can get more information so they can figure out what to do with it later. Um, the, but but if, you, if you said that the, the user is playing it, they must have already purchased it. They must well, already own it, right? Typically, they wouldn't push it for something that they know, but there's tons of music and films which people go, oh, that's so cool. I wish I could get that. Um, ah. And they want to push the, push the button to find out. And, and, or even TV commercials. And in the United States, there's some reasonable, interesting music and TV commercials, but in other cultures like Japan, and, and TV commercials are one of the big ways people find out about music. And so um, oh. it really is it's very interesting. And I think... I think uh, uh, once you start having this kind of functionality inside there, you start pushing it all the time. And uh, we've had some interesting results, <laughs> for example, but we found out that some car sounds came from like a sound effects disc, for example, because when it was, <laughs> which is, you know, they had licensed the library of uh, Porsche auto uh, car sounds. So reality right. is that uh, it's not just music that's in our database. It's literally everything that's been recorded. So um, there's lots of interesting information to find out. I've got a couple of questions from the chat room uh, regarding the database. Um, Uncle Big Bad asks, uh, how often does the database info get updated in the TV or iPod, et cetera, uh, if they are not reachable by the Internet? Now, I believe that this is somewhat uh, uh, confused because the database doesn't reside in the TV or the iPod, right? It's, it's online someplace. Well, all of the software packages typically have a feature where you can call the database to get the latest updates. Okay, so why would you want to do this? Well, you know, information in the database actually gets filled in over time. Um, we may put in a certain set of data, and then other people come along and put, because our database is built, yes, by professionals, our own guys, and by feeds from the record companies and others, but also individuals can put information in. So, you know, mm. this, a couple of years ago, I, you know, we were watching, we see kind of things going on in, on our database, and some guy in Italy was sitting there putting in, you know, aria after aria, I mean, like, I don't know how many put in, hundreds of classes, I mean, every detail, you know, this movement is this, this, so, like, we couldn't put all that detail in ourselves, but he did that. And if you had gotten the da data from our database maybe before, then you would get the basic names of the actual works on the disk, but you, but you wouldn't get all this extra detail. If you call up later, you might get more. And so iTunes is a feature where you can say, you know, update 
your tracks and it'll go off the database and it'll actually get the, if it didn't have album cover art, it'll pull that in and it will also get latest song name. So it's done in the software package and then that then later is transmitted down to the portable player when it does its synchronization. So, but it's not, but that, that data is not stored in the, in the player or the TV, right? It's just shown to you. Yeah, in the TV, it's there's no storage, so it's just temporarily resident kind of in the memory. But in the iPod, there's actually a little database in there that's kind right. of synchronized with all your tracks. So they keep all that stuff in there. It's where your user ratings are and play counts and all the other stuff that's part of the iTunes database. So our data goes in there, and if you update it, it'll eventually make its way into that little file. How much, how much, what percentage of the storage on an iPod is taken up with this metadata then as compared to the actual content? I mean, like, I mean, you're entire music collection might be, you know, if you had a thousand tracks, think about like a, if it's, if it's 500 bytes to kilobyte per album, you know, I mean, it's really not very much. And also text data can be compressed. So some of these things just do basic compression on text data. There's a lot of songs, uh, with, a lot of songs with the word love in the title. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose that's true. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Which brings up another question. How big is your entire database? I mean, is it terabytes, petabytes? Well, <laughs> you can always go. I was going to get this wrong. You go on our website and it tells you what the current number is. I probably should do that right now. But uh, it's it's like we're like 100 million tracks of information on individual tracks. But there are a lot of repeats and duplicates in there just because of the fact that, like I said, you know, the album came out again and again and again, several different companies. And we'll have different entries for each time it came out if it's mm -hmm. changed or it's slightly changed. Um, right. It is, yeah, it's, it's, it's a massive database. You wouldn't want to try to store our database on your iPod. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you mentioned earlier that users can, can um, input data, like this guy in Italy who, who's put in all this uh, stuff about all these ARIAs. Uh, how, do, how do people do that? I mean, is that just anybody can do that? Is it like a Wikipedia kind of a thing, or do you have to sign up, or how does that oh. work? It's usually it only requires the presence of the actual media itself. So kind of the and it has some rules about looking to see if people are trying to submit junk or blanks or those kind of things. So it's self healing in a certain way. But the reality is is that uh, they just need an application that supports the submit feature, which iTunes does. But iTunes doesn't have the richest submit feature. There are other media players like Winamp which have better submit functionality. And so uh, Apple didn't bother to blow out the full like user interface as it were for all the different fields if you really want to go crazy with it. Um, all right. There's another one that's the uh, Quinn Media Player, which has really detailed submission. And there's some tools that are for, you know, people have built the software into our, our, our network services, we're into all kinds of applications, cataloging applications and more professional applications, including even applications for radio stations. So the, the, a lot of the data that's in there, for example, data that comes from like Sirius satellite radio and these kind of things. So a lot of that comes from us as well. So. It's it's very broadly distributed at this point. Uh, if it's a song name and you're looking at it, very likely it uh, it, it came from us in some way. Mm. Well, this is all very fascinating, and we're going to continue in just a moment. But before we do, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode, Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high-quality website or blog. Squarespace.com has an easy-to-use user interface for creating and managing your website or blog, and it's optimized for both beginners and CSS experts. There are hundreds of design templates to choose from, and you can customize any of them to fit your needs. The all-inclusive service has several modules to build your website, including a blog module with import and export support for WordPress, Blogger, Movable Type, and TypePad, uh, forums, a form builder, which lets you collect email addresses and other information from visitors, Flickr photo, Flickr photo display, uh, a Twitter widget, uh, Google Maps, and more. There's website tracking and a built-in search engine optimizer, as well as permission access handling and a cloud architecture for speed and site stability. There's also an innovative drag-and-drop Ajax interface and an iPhone app, which lets you log into your website and update it on the go. Use Squarespace for all your website needs. Build it, post it, update it anytime. For a free trial, go to squarespace.com and sign up for a free account. There's no credit card needed. Just try it out to build your website. Then if you decide to purchase, use the offer code HTG and get a 10% discount off the lifetime of your new account. That's squarespace.com and use the offer code HTG. So Ty, we were talking a little earlier about um, online access and uh, IPTV products such as the LGBT player and the Sony TVs. Um, 
What do you see as the future of connected TVs? And more specifically, TVs and Blu-ray players, I should say. And more specifically, will there ever come a time when all internet content is available directly from a TV or Blu-ray player? Today, each company has partnerships. <clears throat> So you can get Sony and Voodoo, uh, you can get a rather Netflix and Voodoo from a Sony TV. You can get a different set of content from an LG Blu-ray player. Nowhere can you, simp there's no product where you can simply go and get anything online directly from your TV. Do you think that'll ever happen? Okay, well, a couple, there's a couple of topics there. <laughs> <First> <laughs> go for it, man. Let's address the everything online. So I think we're in kind of an embryonic stage for this internet connected content. Um, it's, if you think about it in terms of like a cable television model, like do cable television networks hold out channels on the TV? No, there's if you can get a channel, they can, they have room for it, and they're you know now they have a lot of channel space, so it'd be 300 channels on cable. They'll have the channel on there because they pay them or get revenue for it being on there in some way. Well, so, as long as as long as the cable company gets paid then yeah, they'll, I suppose they'll put it on. We've seen recently uh, some fights uh, amongst, um, I forget whether it was DirecTV or Dish, one of the two, where uh, some of the Fox channels uh, were not there for a while until the down to the last moment of the, of the negotiations before it all crashed and burned, they, they made some deal. So, so you can't get everything on, on cable. That's correct, but I think that probably that model is probably where it's going to go. Which is, in other words, in in the future, I imagine that TV of future will have every internet service that it can do a deal with, which should be most every one. And yes, some will come and go, and some will say I don't want to pay, and some will say I want to pay less. But I think in the in, at the moment, it's it's uh, it's just worth at the beginning of the industry, and people are playing a little bit of uh, you know who's going to dominate the internet. And the reality is, it's very likely there will be many many different sources of video and on, on the internet, not one. And so consumers don't really care. They just want to like buy the TV and go where they want to go. So mm -hmm. the reality is that supporting multiple has already happened. Supporting many will probably happen. And, and what I think is a kind of a future direction, and once you have that, is the same reason you have a guide product on your cable box is, well, okay, let's say if I had 300 internet things I could watch, uh, what am I going to watch? So you're going to have to have some mechanism to help direct you to the things that you want to see. That's easy for consumers to do, and so Grayson's actually working on that kind of stuff. We're basically working on the kind of data to start with that would basically allow people to essentially choose between the various things that are that are out there. And I think you'll see us going more and more in that direction, which is not that different than what we've done for music. You know, we basically help you figure out what you should listen to, whatever mood you're in. Well, what mood am I in, and what video do I want to see, and how should I how should I decide? And so I think the a guide that goes across all of the different uh, channels on the internet in some way is going to be important as well as recommendation technology. And uh, I think that it's, it's, it's a, it's a natural for that to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. Will everything, will everything be on the TV? Well, no, because a lot of content that's on the internet is like textual and better looked at on something like an iPad. And so I guess I want to talk about that, which is, I also think people are developing a new use uh, model, which is that they have a large screen TV with a main content running, and then they have a secondary screen, which is a laptop or an iPad or a phone, which they're using to direct the content that's on the main screen and look up additional information without stopping the main program content. So, for example, if I'm watching a movie with my wife and I want to check out, you know, what the cocktail of James Bond really is drinking there, I don't have to stop the movie, push an interactive button, you know, she'll be like, what are you doing? Instead, I can uh -huh. just pull pull up on my little phone and check it out and, and then make a note to myself to get those ingredients next time I'm out in the store. And so <laughs> the reality is that uh, I don't, I see this second screen application as being a whole new wave of really what's kind of called, called the super remote control. Essentially the idea that you watch a program and then have something that's very powerful, a little computer in your hand, way more powerful than maybe the remotes of the past, although I do realize some of the remote companies are turning their remotes into computers. But the idea essentially is, is that, that that use case model is something that we're focusing on and showing at CES and showing what those experiences could be. And uh, it allows you to interact directly with the program. It allows you to, you know, do quizzes while the program is running. You know, you can be chatting with other people who are watching it simultaneously. Uh, so I really see this interactive, connected television experience is coming to the forefront of, uh, of the basic viewing model very, very quickly. Uh, you know, within the two or three years, I think kids will be like, what do you mean you watch television and you didn't talk to anybody when you watched it? I mean, I, you know, 
weird. You know, it's not that it's also maybe, you know, even my generation, I'm a little <laughs> about what I'm working on, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I see my son, he's 11 years old and he's got a laptop. He's sitting there. He's actually running his laptop while he's playing his PlayStation games. So he can look up online and chat with other people online about what they're doing to figure out how to do it. And so, you know, I can see it coming. And uh, I don't know, maybe we're all going to need ADD medication, but the reality is, is that it is, it is definitely uh, a direction that people are going, and it should improve the experience. I mean, the whole idea of this is to not make you crazy. The idea is to actually let you learn more and uh, uh, let you experience the content in a deeper, maybe more meaningful, personal way. Yeah, I'm actually fascinated by the by your idea here of 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 sort of a two screen approach. You know, the big screen in front of you and the little screen in your lap or in your hand or, or whatever in terms of an iPad or a smartphone or something like that. Uh, I've always thought that it would be interesting to be able to combine television and Internet access on the TV screen. But I've always been a little concerned about how that interrupts the TV experience. On the other hand... If you've got a second screen sitting in your hand or your lap or something, you're interrupting the experience as it is by looking down and looking up and looking around. Um, That's okay. Sure that it's, it's basically the difference is if you want to do it as a uh, – first of all, the big screen, if it's a continuous program, and especially if it's if you're watching it with other people, and those people could be local or remote, right? So you don't right. want to interrupt that because that's like throwing the train wreck you know everyone's you know the thing about film or television is there's kind of a suspension just you know you're kind of you're kind of sucked into this thing and you're kind of forgetting a little bit where you are but right. if you want to look down and just you know if all that was on your your second screen was your best friend you know giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down you know or something kind of indicating the level of bad acting that's actually going on there something funny you might find that interesting and mm. uh I think also people are going to be sharing what they're experiencing out into their social network. So while you're watching the movie, you know, you really like this actress or you really think this guy, that car is so cool. You push a button and that, that just gets right immediately shot out to your Facebook page and a photo of the car will be there and they'll say, you know, Bob was watching, you know, James Bond and this is the car that he'd be five that he saw, you know. And so that, that interaction between the social network, the media experience, you know, some of these things are happening on Blu-ray today, but I think you'll see over the next couple of years, this is going to become a, a really big deal. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier uh, a guide to all of the Internet content. And uh, it seems to me that Google TV was trying to do that. And only recently <laughs> they pulled back. They, uh, <laughs> they have told their, their manufacturer partners, Sony and Logitech and others, uh, not to <laughs> demonstrate and announce uh, the, those things at CES. Uh, and they've even, uh, I got a report just today, something about uh, asking their Taiwanese, uh, Logitech anyway, asking their Taiwanese manufacturer to stop making the review box. Um, is Grace Note attempt, working on a, uh, something like that, a guide to everything well, on the Internet? Hey, no, we're providing, we're creating the information database that would power the thing. I think in their case, this is much more an implementation and user interface challenge that they have. And so mm. we create that. Almost all the companies we work with, they create their own expression. I mean, Apple's completely in charge of its user interface and how its consumers interact with its products. And so Google is in charge of their products. And the reality is, is that maybe they want to make some changes. That would just be my, my guess. But I think yeah. uh, uh, the the data to make these things really work is there now, although there'll be better better data in the future as more people use these things. Of course, we'll be able to get richer uh, user data and other things like that. The, the reality is is that uh, uh, I think it's still the very first product. I mean, if you think about this Google TV thing, it's the very first product, you know? I, you know, I don't use my Mozilla 1.0 you know, that much anymore. You know, like, <laughs> True enough. It takes like five minutes to draw a GIF file. So the reality is that that you know, I think that to give them a chance, it's it's going to take them a little while to get the get the thing tuned exactly right. But the reality is, this kind of a product, which is really what I call an in mixing of internet and television and information, is definitely coming. Mm -hmm. Whether or not the first version of this is the ultimate version, I hardly I hardly doubt. It. I'm sure that you know every one of these products takes typically to the version 3.0. By version 3.0, it's pretty good. So yeah. you've got to start, and you can't just start with three. <laughs> no, this, this is this is why I never buy version 1.0 of anything because it can't be eye at your house that says, you know, I know this is kind of weird, but look how cool it is, you know. I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm, I'm not always a version 1.0 guy, but I, I like to get version 1.0 because it's the one where it's very raw and I can learn from it, you know. So for me, it's a, 
opportunity to, you know, I don't care if it's imperfect, you know, I still want to check it out. I want to be the mm. first guy to understand what's good about it. Every product has something good and it's worthwhile seeing sure. this. You mentioned earlier iTunes Genius Service. Uh, tell us a bit about that. Well, Genius was the idea. I mean, the, the genius of Genius is really <laughs> is <this laughs> thing, while people were playing music in iTunes, wouldn't it be nice if while they were playing it, they could actually see recommendations for other things they should buy? Uh, because the reality is the best time to sell somebody music is when they're listening to music. Mm. And so before what happened, I mean, this is a very typical use case. People would play the songs in their iTunes and just play and 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 play. play, play. They never ever think to open the window and buy anything unless they were stimulated by some external marketing thing like a magazine article they read or a newspaper article or a book that they saw and, or music they heard from a friend maybe they remembered to look for it. So the most important thing for just helping the music business, which has not been doing super well. It's just the ability to actually uh, let people know if you're listening to Eric Clapton, there's this new thing from Eric Clapton that you should look at. And so the first thing it does is just from your basic collection you have is find other things that you would like. Beyond that, the, the next level really is trying to expand people's musical knowledge. You know, if you ask people to list the number of music artists that they know, so if you just go to the average person and say, from A to Z, tell me all the names of the music artists you know. Some people may know 10. <laughs> some may know a hundred. Some may know a thousand. Okay, but that's really that's a really smart, well-educated musical person. It'd be great if everyone knew, you know, fifty. And the reality is, if that that would help more than anything in the world for musicians to to do well out there, is if people just knew more about them. And so, so mm -hmm. these services are critical because it's really what we what we've lost in the physical world is we can't go to the store anymore. And yes, if we did have the the gumption to approach the you know pierced guy with the purple hair and ask him what he thought of this record you had in your hand, he might recommend something else to you. But the computer can now make it easier, more accessible, and can do it on a global basis. So the music's, you know, that guy may have known about a few things himself, but he didn't know about music from, you know, Jamaica or music from South America. So the computer can now do this. And so I think really, um, if I was to kind of put on a grand scale, that recommendation technology is critical. It's really the brain, as it were, of how people find out and experience music on the planet now. And iTunes having so many users, it's a very important brain. It's probably the number one way people in the digital ecosystem find out about music. So our data goes in there. Um, we have, you know, like I said, very rich data on uh, you know, the type of music that you have, the genre, the classification of the music. It's very important to understand you know, what other music is related to it to put music into kind of a, uh, an organizational structure so you can have some way of referring to it or a way of making intelligent recommendations. Um, it's not really done just by purchase. You know, he, Bob bought this, so you'll like that. That turns mm -hmm. out to be incredibly simplistic. And in fact, actually, that's called collaborative filtering. While that is an important technology to be inside the recommendation systems, it's important to put that into perspective. That, that technology, which, which does that, can oftentimes just uh, bring up least common denominator. So like, oh, you play the Stones, you should get the Beatles. You know, like, well, I didn't need the recommendations. Tell me about the Beatles. Uh, you should, you play this jazz artist, you should get Miles Davis, you know. The <laughs> 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 reality is, well, uh, yeah, yes, okay, but the reality is it'd be great if it was subtler than that. And so really the, the, the artful nature of how these, the, you know, and these kind of recommendation systems are now in like their third generation and they're getting more and more sophisticated to really expand people's musical taste. That's a very subtle thing, because what it should really do is say, oh, you know, you like this kind of folk rock, you know, well, have you ever heard about bluegrass? You know, here's this bluegrass band that's kind of folk rocky bluegrass, so it's a good step for you to get into this new area, and maybe you'll like it. And so take people off into kind of areas that are a little outside of their, of absolutely what they absolutely know that they love, to try to expose them to some new artists, and to some new music that, that they'll grow. Music is an acquired taste. It's not something that, you know, people... People learn to like music. They don't just are born with an instant love of Jimi Hendrix guitar solos. And so right. <laughs> it, it's a, it's a, a, a important for these technologies to really go forward. And I think video will be the same way. There's so much great content that's out there uh, on all types of topics that will be now appearing on the web. A lot of it's been in vaults for years. And so, you know, if you want to know about, uh, you know, the... Luxor in Egypt, or you want to know about food or cooking, or you want to know what it was like to live in the, you know, Louisiana at the time the French there, you know, that stuff's out there, and you'll be able to find it. Uh, just going to take the right recommendation and search engine to get, get you to it. I'm hoping. Now, that does the does the recommendation come from 
the metadata or is there some sort of, say in the case of music, um, uh, uh, listening, quote unquote, the computer, the system, listening, quote unquote, to the music and coming up with recommendations based on uh, tempo or uh, instrumentation or anything like that. I've heard of some systems that do that. Yes, actually, we, we do all three. I'll explain to you for music what it is. So for music, there's the factual data about, you know, what year was this recorded, what's the name of the band, who was an influencer of that band, what era are they from, and what's the genre of music. And these are all like things that our editorial staff, you know, that's facts, okay? This is a psychedelic rock band from 1967 from San Francisco. Okay, then the next part is on an individual song basis, what does this band sound like? Okay, yes, it's psychedelic rock, but... But this is a psychedelic rock from song from the Grateful Dead, but not all the Grateful Dead songs were psychedelic rock. They had some kind of folky, bluesy songs and some actual folk, folk songs. And it turns out they members play bluegrass, so there's even some bluegrass stuff in there. So the reality is a lot of that extra subtlety is actually derived now by what's called machine listening. Essentially, Grace Notes developed technology, which actually, you can imagine, plays the track extracts out of it the basic chord structures, instrumentation, and kind of melodic details, and then compares this to kind of a standardized a super test set of music that we created, which essentially lets us say this is bluegrass or folk, and we essentially can, on a track-by-track -track basis now, understand what the songs actually sound like. And we couldn't really pay or hire individual people to listen to every single song. It's out in you know, 100 million songs. Mm. We have to pay everyone in the United States to listen to songs. <laughs> so the reality... <laughs> It's actually also somewhat better to have a machine that's trained by humans, which is what we did. We put our energy into the training set. That's good because we can have, a, I'll call it, a relatively manageable set of experts categorize all this global music, and then the system can kind of go from there. But also the system's pretty fair because it's a kind of a machine listening program. One of the challenges with human editorial is like what I think is classic rock, you think is, you know, folk rock. And so, so you know, how do you make people think the same? It's hard, but with a computer program, and the way we've done it, we've actually come up with a pretty good model. Sure we'll uh, this, is, this is fascinating to me, actually, because uh, uh, genre classification is actually not so easy. And, no. and different, different tunes can be classified in multiple genres, for example. That's right. Our system supports multiple genres. And we have a, another system, which are called correlates, which essentially is, okay, so this song is uh, related to this other, other type of music, but it's related in such a, a, a mathematical way. It's a little bit folk, it's a little bit bluegrass. How do you have a system that represents kind of fuzzy relations? and mm, Kind of waiting between it's mostly folk rock, but there's a little bit of something else in it, that kind of thing? I'll just give you an example of something even more challenging. So people that like The Grateful Dead like, you know, Bob Dylan. But Bob Dylan and The Grateful Dead have nothing to do with each other musically. Mm. It really, really, actually, they're connected at the messaging kind of thing. You know, The Grateful Dead stood for counterculture and the message that they sent out there about life and times, and people connected with that, also connected with some of Bob Dylan's messaging, and some of, the, some of them uh, connected with some of the other things he was doing, but it, actually musical styles are very, very different. And so, but there's a lot of crosstalk, so if you, if you gave someone who, who liked Bob Dylan a recommendation of some Grateful Dead material, they might actually like it. And so that, that kind of thing is the kind of thing where you have to build a very flexible system to allow that. And some of it's also cultural, I mean, frankly, Artists are, you know, sometimes they are a song, but they're more about their hairstyle and where they're from. And so, <laughs> you know, uh, I won't name any names, but the reality is that some artists also wouldn't be who they are without their story. You know, it's one thing to hear you too and to hear their music and to to know, go out. It's a really cool pop song. But if you understand they're from Ireland and if you listen to some of those early songs and there was a lot of strife that was going on there, you get a whole broader meaning about what the band U2 is really about. And so uh, it's hard to think about it, but, you know, artists aren't just their songs. They're people. They live. They do stuff. And so, so really, you're, you're trying to figure out how to have a system that represents not just their musical information, but a little bit of their life and times as well. And so we aren't there yet with all of that, but that's one of the things we're going to be showing at, uh, at the uh, CES show where we've got some very interesting examples there of trying to go into cultural references for music so people can look at. You can actually find music by, well, you could find music by hairstyle, but by the clothes or the location. <laughs> Believe me, you know, that, that, it, that or the culture that the artist comes from. That, that's exactly right. And, and I got to say, you know, the, the use of just even location, just being able to take a, a thing and move around the globe and say, you know, what kind of music is going on here, you know? And uh, you'd, be, you'd be surprised. And uh, you'd be surprised at the, 
the you know great amount of rock music that's going on in West Virginia right now. And you know, I mean, there's just there's just <laughs> stuff uh, uh, that doesn't make it necessarily into the headlines. That's happening everywhere because there's young people picking up guitars and picking up microphones everywhere doing something. And uh, uh, it really is important as well to kind of stay a little bit in touch with some of the new things that are going on. It's great to recommend Eric Clapton, but it's also great to recommend you know some guy that's that's got something hot that's happening in your local scene just to find out about that. So the tools yeah. to are, are there, and and there's what I what I would say about it is is that there's more music than ever being consumed and played. It's harder to make money, I think, as a as an artist selling recordings, but there's but there's no shortage of things being listened to that are out there, and uh, I think it's uh, uh, I think the future is relatively bright. The good news is it's not like people are not listening to music. That would be like really bad. <laughs> 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 oh, people are listening to music all the time. It's true. Right. The key is how to monetize it for these, these artists, but the reality is it's definitely people are listening to it, so that's good. At least we have an audience, so let's now figure out what we need to do to help teach people about broader amounts of music and make it a better ecosystem for people. Um, right, and connect people with music that they might otherwise not discover uh, yes. in, in the ways we've been talking about. That's right, and also music connects people. Their people are, uh, you know, music is one of the top topics on social networks, and, you know, in other words, when you get together and talk about something with somebody, you know, it's kind of the old party phenomenon. Why? Why play music at a party? Because it gives people something to talk about. They can hate it or love it, but at least they're talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's, Which is uh, rarely a bad thing. Almost always a good thing. Almost always a good thing. Yes. Well, great. Thanks, Ty. I really appreciate you being on the show. And um, people can uh, check out uh, Grace Note's website at gracenote.com. Uh, my online homes are ultimateavmag.com and hometheatermag.com. Uh, you can email me at scott at twit.tv and follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott. Next week, I'll be chatting with some of my colleagues, including Michael Fremer, about what to expect at the upcoming CES. You've gotten a taste of it today with uh, what we can see, what we're going to see at Grace Note, which I'll certainly be coming by uh, their booth or room or wherever they are. And uh, next week, we'll be talking a lot more about that. So hope you'll join me for that. Until then, geek out.